Greetings and praise the Lord. Welcome to the Green Pastures Tabernacle Midweek Program. My name is Abel and I'm so glad that you are joining us tonight. Welcome to our program. We always come to you every Wednesday from 8 to 9 p.m. And I want you to kindly um, just share this link with your family members, your friends, and in, in, with anyone else who is in your circles of influence. Tonight, we are going to listen to a message that was preached by a bishop on confounded by God's wisdom. Probably you have some questions and you are asking yourself, how can I go about this? Well, just listen to this message and we believe that God is going to bless you. See you after you have listened to it. Today, I am led to speak to you on a topic I have uh, coined, confounded by God's wisdom. Confounded by God's wisdom. <clears throat> that word confound is simply um, an exaggerated or a glorified word for perplexed, confused, um, dismayed, um, surprised. So you can use all those words uh, when you use the word confounded. It's just a place where your mind cannot reconcile what you probably know, what you expect, and what the reality is. And as I speak about this, you discover that this not only applies this season that we are in, but it applies to our lives throughout, ever since we got to know right from wrong. There are always things that are confounding us, and especially in the context of our faith in the Lord Jesus. It becomes even harder when we do not even seem to understand God and what he is doing. Go with me to the Bible in the book of Judges, chapter 6. If you want to understand this, and of course this is a very well-known passage of Scripture, it is the oppression uh, uh, of the nation of Israel by Midianites. And the particular character here is Gideon. Most of us know Gideon, very famous young man. And um, I think he is also, you remember, there's a society that they call Gideon, Gideon's Bible uh, Society, where they used to place Bibles in hotels. Uh, I don't know whether they still do it, especially in the advent of um, in the advent of uh, online Bibles and the cost of the Bible. The Bible has become a very expensive book, and, but those days you go to a hotel room and you never miss a green you know, little Bible, and that was a powerful thing. So I think that ministry was named after Gideon, just that army of Gideon. So um, this is the situation where the nation of Israel has come to a place whereby they are really suffering under the hands of the Midianites. And every time they plant a crop, the, media, the Midianites come in, and they just wait until harvest time. And when it's just about harvest time, they raid and take away everything. And so we are coming into Gideon in that space when he is actually oppressed and he is very scared about what is going on uh, in the nation of Israel. So let me begin from verse 11. The Bible says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Oprah, which belonged to Joash, the Abesrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in a wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. You may not understand the situation that Gideon and the people were in. 
I have had an experience of visiting a wine press in Nazareth once. And that's, I think, the only one I ever visited. And the wine press was actually hewn into the rocks at the lower part of the field because um, there's a way when they brought in the grain, I mean the, 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 the grapes, then they would uh, press them and then the wine would flow uh, to a place where then they would now collect it. They, it. There needed to be some gravity work. And when you think about wheat and, and grapes, they are two very different products. Threshing wheat requires just a simple, flat, open field. But the wine press were really hidden for reasons of, first of all, security, and secondly, hygiene. It was necessary that the wine press be in a place that is not easily accessible to people, animals, or even dust and other debris that would contaminate the wine that would be pressed. But the situation is so dire with Gideon and his people that they have now to change the functions of a wine press from being a wine press into a wheat threshing you know, floor. And I'm just trying to show you how dire this situation is to the point that actually Gideon begins to ask very interesting questions as he wonders where God is because of the problems that they are facing. And that's going to be really like our basis of what we are going to discuss today. You notice that Gideon is actually confused because the first thing that the angel of the Lord does is he calls him a mighty man of valor. Now, this is a mighty man who is actually hiding and is breaking all the agricultural rules because of fear, and yet he is being told that he's a mighty man of valor. Mighty men of valor don't hide from their enemies, but he is hiding. And God, who is actually calling a mighty man of valor, is nowhere to be seen, according to Gideon. And Gideon has very pertinent questions like most of us ask. We keep asking all these questions all the time. If God is with us, then why am I seeing what I'm seeing? If God is there, why do I have pain? And we'll come into that so that I don't go ahead of my, my, myself. So that is really the you know, basis of what I am going to be talking about. And so to introduce my sermon, I begin by saying that God is all wise and his wisdom is unmatched. It is always important for us as Christians to understand that we are dealing with a God who doesn't lack wisdom in any way, and his knowledge is not uh, fathomable. We cannot come to the place whereby we begin to explain the wisdom and the knowledge of God. God knows the end from the beginning. It is difficult to know the end from the beginning because before you begin something, you cannot know its end. And yet, the God we serve and the God we worship is that type of a God who knows the end before even things begin. And this we find in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9, the B portion of that verse, all the way to verse 10, where God says, For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So God describes himself in those two short verses that he says, I am God and there is no other God. So any time we try to equate God with anybody else, we are making a very big mistake because it's already a defined declaration that there can never be someone else who is like God. And he says, I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient of times that are not yet done. That is the God we are talking about. You see, God knows what has happened. God knows what will happen. And God knows what could have happened in any given scenario. Some of you play scenarios in your own lives. You play scenarios of what if I went to another school? What if I was born in central province, and especially those of us who come from Eastern? Once in a while, we, we, we think that way. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. Once in a while, when you, like now, 
at this season, if you try to move towards southeast, you will know that some of us are asking, why does it have to be this way? You know, this is a time when uh, if you try to sell anybody a piece of land in southeastern Kenya, they will tell you, even if you give it to me for free, I am I'm grateful. One time I went with one brother in church here. I wouldn't mention his name. And when we arrived in our home, instead of just thanking God that we have gotten to my home, he turned around and asked me, Bishop, what do people here eat? <laughs> <laughs> and some of our sisters who are here who are married in Southeastern, you know how your parents struggled to let you go because uh, there are even rumors that we used to eat one another. It is that serious. But that is not true because I never ate my brothers. Those who have survived are still there, all right? So anyway, <laughs> let me move away from that. Interestingly, this infinite wisdom of our God that brings us so much comfort is the very wisdom that leaves us very confused. The infinite wisdom of God, which makes us trust that God is in church, that makes us go to sleep, and we believe that the sun will rise. That same wisdom that makes us stay today and we believe that the sun will set. Let me tell you something. If something happened and we stay, and by 4 o'clock, the sun is where it is at 10, you see the kind of confusion that we will have. But how many of you even pray and ask God, Lord, today we pray that the sun will rise. And we pray that the sun will keep its trajectory and set at 6.30 or 6.45. We don't do that. That is the infinite wisdom of God. That same wisdom which brings us so much comfort that we can sit here and believe that the earth will not swallow us is the same wisdom that really confuses us at times. The wisdom that leads us to worship is the same wisdom that leads us to wonder. There are moments that instead of worshiping, you just wonder. Some of you have woken up in situations whereby you even try to worship God, but you can't. All you do is wonder. You are full of questions and questions without answers. And some of you make our life very hard as pastors when you try to ask those questions. Because even us, let me tell you, we have more questions than you have. <laughs> we are perplexed and dismayed by the Lord's decisions and mystified by his decrees. For example, if you were Gideon, and you know very well you're so fearful, you know that even your own father is scared. Your own armies as a nation of Israel are so worried about the Midianites, and yet an angel of the Lord comes and calls you mighty men of all. What would it make you perplexed because of that kind of a decree? When God says that I love you and you don't feel his love, when God says that he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and you know that there are moments you have struggled to even put food on the table, where is this God? How can we not be perplexed by these kind of questions? How do you explain that you've been a faithful tither? You've given to God. And then one of these days you wake up and you can't even afford to take your child to school. You have no money. And there are so many questions we have. You see, without necessarily doubting God, we are unsettled, scared, anxious, wondering, asking, guessing, and trying to make sense of a chaotic world that appears to be out of the control of the Creator. I have often wondered why a good God allows people to suffer. In 1986, there was a story of a certain journalist. A story is told he was in Ethiopia, and he found this very emaciated kid. And I think the picture circulates a lot even on social media today. Some of you may have been very young those days. And 
you know, uh, there were vultures waiting for this kid to die so that they can eat him. And this journalist took the photo and circulated in the world. And of course, it drew a lot of sympathy. And those of you that know, there's a song that was sung by 50 American musicians called We Are the World. And they raised a lot of millions of dollars to support the famine in Africa and other parts of the world. And particular, that particular project was for Ethiopia. Um, of course, story has it that uh, some people were very annoyed by this journalist because they said that because there were two vultures, some people wrote and said there were not two vultures in that space, there were three. The two waiting to eat the kid and the journalist who took the photo. Because the argument was, what did he do with the child? Because he may have just taken the photo and left the child there. I'm giving you that story, just trying to show you how the world sometimes can be very unfair. What did that child do to die that way and to be waited for by vultures like an animal? Where was God who created this child? Yet in another part of the world, there was too much affluent, people throwing away food. And that balance cannot be found. These are the questions we have as human beings, and they are very difficult questions, and nobody has an answer. And that's why I'm saying there are times we try to make sense of a chaotic world that appears to be out of control. God seems like he's not in control. How do we explain people, you know, publicly, you know, um, pushing us to do things that are ungodly, to eat things that are, we know are going to destroy our brains, to run lifestyles we know are against the natural acts of human beings. And yet nobody seems to think that this is a problem. In fact, governments are legislating and allowing some of things to happen. And you almost feel like, God, have you lost control of this world? Where are we heading? We are not alone. And we are not the first. Scripture records instances of cries of confusion by godly people, starting with Gideon himself. O oh Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about? And then he concludes and says, but now, the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. That is a child of God, accusing God, telling God, you have forsaken us, you have left us. In fact, you have even delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And that's where it gets when you start hearing Christians saying that God is using this problem to teach me something. Because we always need to have an explanation for what happens. I come from a place where things don't just happen. They are made to happen. <laughs> so it is very unsettling to stay without trying to provide answers to questions. And that tells you, because of these many questions, anybody that looks like he's offering solutions will attract many people. That's why if I tell you, if you step on this carpet, the Lord spoke to me last night. If you just step on this carpet, all your problems will disappear. We will wear it out within minutes. And that's why you notice there's been an explosion of cults and false prophets in the whole world. Because there are too many questions that nobody seems to have a solution to. So if you can get someone who appears like they know why you have a problem. you will have so many people. That's one of the reasons why in a few years ago, we used to have an explosion of deliverance classes. Where you go through a deliverance class for years, because somebody has told you certain levels of deliverance you need to go through, that's why you are struggling, that's why you are buried, that's why your children are not getting math A in class. And a lot of people went into that. And of course, sooner or later, you begin to discover, even after five years of deliverance class, 
you still have questions. And the curriculum keeps on being improved to answer more of your questions. More classes are added. Can I tell you something? If you go to a good church where the scriptures are well taught, you don't need any deliverance class. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. I know, of course, it's a place for power encounter, and we believe that God encounters us in power. Scripture records instances of cries of confusion by godly people. Job. That's one man who had more questions than anyone could answer. Why do you hide your face and consider me your enemy? Job 13, 24. Job has gotten to a place where he's even telling God, you are my enemy. In Psalm chapter 10, verse 1, the psalmist is confused, is confounded, perplexed, dismayed. He's asking God, why do you stand afar, O Lord? Why do you hide your, your face in times of trouble? The psalmist is in trouble, but he's telling God, you have stood afar. You say you're all powerful. You can do anything. You say my feet will not be touched against a stone, but here I am. I'm all alone. Where are you? These are godly people in Scripture. The psalmist again, two verses, 44, verse 2 and 23. Why have you rejected me? And why do you sleep, O oh Lord? Funny enough, the same psalmist, many years later, I mean many chapters later in, verse, in Psalm 121, verse 3 to 4, he says he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps, you will not sleep or will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. So at one point, the psalmist is actually accusing God of sleeping on the job. And yet the same psalm is many years later, or many chapters later, he's saying the Lord does not sleep, no slumber. This happens. You remember John the Baptist. John the Baptist, when he is baptizing people and the presence of God is so strong, the anointing is so powerful, people are being drawn from Jerusalem, Judea, and all over the place into the wilderness. When he sees Jesus, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of man. A few months or years later, I don't know how long it took, he begins to send people and go and ask Jesus, are you the one who was to come? Because sometimes we, are, we get confused. The same God who gives you re the revelation of who the Lamb of God is, he seems like he has changed his mind and you have to send your people now to go and reconfirm, are you really the one who was to come? Oh, I was just too excited because of what was going on that morning. If you have never gotten there as a Christian, then I'm not sure you are a proper Christian. And that's why by the end of this service today, I want you to know that it is okay to feel the way you feel. Psalm 22 verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a psalmist. He feels left out by God. And remember, this is the same psalmist two chapters later. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, though I walk through the valley of the shadow. So you find yourself that sometimes you're on top of things and declaring things and great wonders. And other times you're right in the valley wondering, is God really there? That's a life that we must contend with as human beings. And it's okay. We all ask many questions. Why is evil prospering? How come most of the people are not in church this morning? They are either asleep or they are preparing to go and start drinking at 11 or the way to 6, driving the best cars. Yet those of us who believe in the Lord have labored and are honest and faithful. We even struggle to pay bus fare to come to worship a God who is powerful and is supposed to prosper us. If God is so good, why is it that people don't want him? 
If heaven is such a wonderful place, why aren't people flocking to church? Some of you know very bad people who look like they are doing better than very good people. In my place, they say, good people don't live very long. But people who cause problems, they don't seem to die quickly. And I'm sure you can bear witness to that. There are people you think God will just kill them this morning, but he's not killing them. They keep giving us problems, isn't it? Why can't he do that? If he wants the world then to be a friendly and nice place to be. Why does it seem that the Lord has forgotten me even though I have been faithfully serving him? There are people here who have served the Lord for many years. You have trusted him for things. There are cases of situations where couples have served the Lord, not just with their time, but with their money, with their resource, everything. They have given their life to church. And they don't have a baby. The others who have been tithing faithfully, but their jobs have come to a halt suddenly. Doesn't God know that the church that you go to will require that tithe next month? Today there are going to be many questions. Why is there so much pain in my life? Why is there so much sorrow and hurt within our family? Some of you, your families have endured pain. Almost every month or every few months, a relative dies. A nephew, a niece, a cousin, an uncle, a parent, sibling doesn't seem to come to an end. And this is where it gets very sensitive and dangerous. Because if someone just comes and tells you, it's because there were things that were planted behind your mother's home in 1960. The statistics are just too plain. It can't be for nothing, Charles. There must be what? Something. And that's where it gets dangerous. That's where people lose their faith because nobody has preached to you what I'm going to tell you today. Why is there so much injustice in this world? There's so much injustice. A very innocently hungry boy steals a neighbor's chicken because he just wants to eat and he is caught he is beaten up and just about to be burned with a tire and then taken to court and he stays in remand because nobody can pay, pay bail for him he stays in remand for three years and then he's jailed for ten years Someone else steals one billion shillings taxpayers' money. But nobody asks him anything. That's injustice. Too much of it. You fail to return your taxes for just one month. and you pay a heavy penalty. Someone else is siphoning and evading tax worth billions and nothing will be done to them. God, why do you allow such things to happen? That is the world we live in. So why do we get confounded? Let me give you about two or three reasons. The first thing why we become very confounded is because of the sovereignty of God. I told you, to be sovereign means that 
you know everything. You are all knowing. There is nothing you don't know. You are all powerful. There is nothing you cannot do. And you are everywhere at the same time. In other words, you are not limited by space or time. The very fact that Therefore, God must be God. It is good enough reason for us to be confused about him. Because if you understood God, he wouldn't be God. Let's not even go to God. We don't understand each other. Forget about God. I've been married to Pastor Anne for the last 31 years. I still don't understand her. And she doesn't understand me. Oh, I've lied, Pastor. I've lied. <laughs> I'm right, isn't it? There are times you look at me and you wonder, what's wrong with this man? We don't understand each other. Your colleagues are the place of work. You think they are your colleagues only to discover they are just undermining you. They love with you. They even take you out for lunch. But behind the scenes, they are scheming how to make you fail so that either they bring someone they want or they take your job. Some of you, your own siblings, you are born together. Some of you even share the womb with them, your mother's womb. And you discover these guys, they are actually planning how to disenfranchise you from your father's estate. And they are your blood, blood brethren. So I want you to know the very fact that God is so complicated, God is so big, God is sovereign, that that is enough reason for us not to understand him. So don't try. Because if you can't even understand your own fellow men, you cannot understand your own pastor. Some of you don't understand me, I know, completely. So how do you begin to understand my boss if you can't understand me? Confusion happens not because God has any defect, but because the infinite will always confuse the finite. Or the finite. Infinite is something that cannot be understood. Or something that has no limitation. Finite is something that can be understood and limited. For example, those of you that did maths, you remember there's something you used to call infinite. Infinity. Both negative and positive. You count until you can't finish. You can't understand that. So the fact that God is infinite and we are finite, it is going to confound us. We are limited. God is not limited. So the limited cannot understand the unlimited. It can't work. That's the reason big enough. And that's why the Bible says, Isaiah 55 verse 9, and I saw someone trying to uh, project this verse earlier. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It is that simple. As heavens are higher than the earth, nobody knows how far the heavens are. In fact, nobody knows the location of the heavens. The general term for heavens that we use casually is where the clouds are, but that's not the heavens. <laughs> this is just the Earth's atmosphere. We have not even gone beyond the stratosphere. God's knowledge cannot be plumbed. There is, there is something that uh, Masons call the plumb line. It's unplumbable. You cannot use a plumb to try and measure that. It's a bottomless ocean. Is an immeasurable line. 
is simply unfathomable. God's knowledge is unattainable, is unsearchable. So for that reason, you will remain confounded. If you can bring God to a place where you can understand him, then you will not have problems. But the fact that you can't, you'll be confounded. And that's important for believers to understand. That we cannot understand God because he's sovereign. So because he's God, we'll get confounded. How many of you look at some machines and just the way it is done, and it's just done by human hands, it just confuses you. You look at a computer and you wonder, how does this thing work? How can it just store things? And when I click some things, it brings that information. When you start to think, you realize that it is okay to understand that because of who God is and because of his sovereignty, then we will get confounded. The second reason why we get blessed, confused, and confounded is because of the limitation of the human mind. The limitation of the human mind. Our minds are limited. God created us that way, with limits. We don't know everything. In fact, we just don't know everything. The best way we would say we know some things, a few things. There is so much to know that we are just allowed to know so much. And no wonder, when human beings know too many things, they become useless. Have you noticed that? Have you ever noticed when you know too many things, you actually become useless? People who are effective know a few things and they do them well. But if you know many things, you become confused because you are spending too much time engaging on so many things that you can handle. And that's why God creates us limited. I've always told you that the default nature of human being is two legs so that you are limited in how far you can go. God would have created us with some supersonic booms to be able to go quickly anywhere we want to go, but he never did that. So vehicles are our own creation and aeroplanes. But naturally, if you cannot access an airplane or a car or a bicycle, then God expects you to just move within a radius. Of, how many kilometers can you move in a day? It's okay. Look at somebody tell them it's okay to be localized. Because we put too much pressure on ourselves trying to buy cars. And God is just saying, why don't you just conduct your business within walking distance? We complicate life. The limitation of the human mind is such that it cannot fully comprehend God and his ways. That's why some of the questions we ask, like why is there so much injustice? It's because we don't know what minds God is. Why would he allow a little kid to suffer, to be so hungry he can't run away and birds are waiting to eat him up like an animal? Where was God? I can't understand that. Psalm 139 verse 6, the Bible says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. The psalmist got to a place whereby he was at peace with himself. He realized this wisdom and knowledge of God, I cannot attain it. I've got to just accept that this is God, that's how he is. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 verse 25, the Bible says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Think about that. If God were to be foolish, <laughs> because he's not, because this is a human, this is a human mind trying to explain how different God is. 
how unlimited God is and how limited we are. He says, the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. It's hard to think about that. The foolishness of God. What we classify, what will be classified as God's foolishness is still wiser. So how foolish are we? Wow. The third reason why we will get confounded, believe it or not, is because of the love of God. I love this one. God loves us so much that he will not inform us of his work if it is too heavy a burden for us to bear. John 16 verse 12, Jesus speaking, he says to the disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Why did Jesus do that? Because he loved them. If he told them what was in his heart and mind at that point, I think the whole enterprise of the gospel would have collapsed there and then. Because they would have said, eh, you look for other men, we are not going to be part of this. But he told them, I have so many things I want to tell you, but because you will not bear them, I will not tell you. Let me bring it to context. There are many parents here. And you wake up one morning, mom and dad, four kids or five or two. You know that the auctioneers are on your neck. You know that uh, your job is on the line. And you know that even your own marriage is crumbling. How many of you call your children and say, Let me tell you, from tomorrow I will be jobless. The next day there will be no money for food. And after next week, this father of yours is walking out on me. How many do that? What do we do? Wise parents will keep that information to themselves and ensure that these kids, whichever way it will happen, even if it means stealing, God forbid, you put food on the table for the sake of these children. Why? Because you love them. Because it's information, if you give them, you destroy them. Can somebody say amen? amen? That is what God does to us. God knows the things that are ahead of us, but he won't tell them to us. He will manage the situation quietly, because if he does, you will want to hang yourself so that the things he is telling you, they won't find you. That's why sometimes, don't be too quick to tell God, show me my future, show me my future. If he shows you, you will hang yourself. <clears throat> Just live one day at a time. Look through history of the word of God. God rarely told people the problems they would experience where they are going. Many times you tell them good things. Milk, honey, wells you didn't dig, vines you didn't plant, and houses you didn't build. But he didn't tell them they would be Midianites. So God loves us so much that because of his love, he will keep us away from certain information because we cannot bear it. In love, the Lord only explains what we are ready to receive. And that's why if God hasn't told you how your tomorrow is, just settle down, go and sleep, and leave today. When you wake up tomorrow, God will find something for you. That's why the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. In conclusion, in 
conclusion. Number one, it is okay to be confounded. I want you to help me preach to your friend. Look at them, tell them it's okay to feel the way you're feeling. It's okay. You are not, it's not that you don't have faith. We have misunderstood the faith so much that when people express doubt, we rebuke them. Where is your God? Why are you speaking negative? It's okay to be confounded. Because confusion is the seedbed for greater faithfulness. A seedbed is a place where you germinate seeds. So when you are confused, that's when your faith is born. Because you have to trust God to walk through a dark place. That's how your faith is built. you will still continue to serve the Lord even when you haven't seen what he has promised. You will continue to tithe even when you see your fortunes are dwindling. That's a seedbed for greater faithfulness. <coughs> you see, bewilderment and anxiety forces us to trust someone greater than ourselves. When you have, that's why you hear people, when you hear somebody saying, Nimeachia Mungu. That statement, Ya Nimeachia Mungu, it is because of what? Bewilderment. Kwani unachia Mungu, akua anafanya mbeleni? Because it's a human statement, isn't it? Perplexity causes us to think outside the box of our own strength and control. When we are perplexed, we think outside the box. Some of you, during your moments of law, that's when you have discovered who you are. A good example is during COVID. COVID completely took us off guard, everybody. And the fact that we are still alive today because God was merciful to us. Some of us contracted, we healed. But even then, there was a bigger problem <clears throat> of livelihoods being challenged. And yet, here we are. Our children are still in school. We are still paying rent. And if you follow through, you'll find most of you thought outside the box. There are things you did that you never have done if that perplexing situation was not in your hand. And then, again, mystery humbles us before our God. When you are able to manage everything by your own strength, it is very easy to be proud. People who can virtually manage any situation they want to manage are uncontrollable and unmanageable. But the moment you come to a place whereby you can't, even your money can't help you, your money can't buy what you want, that's the point where you start hearing people, even on their deathbed, saying, call the pastors to come and pray for me. Because you have tried to answer all the questions the way you know. With all the money and the experts you have, they can't answer your questions. Perplexity humbles us. You come to a place whereby you can't brag to people. God has brought you to your knees and you're willing to listen to him, and you respect people, you are not arrogant. People who have everything they want going their way are very dangerous people. And that's why they say, never trust anyone that walks without a limb, or never trust anyone that has no scars because they are yet to face life. Their life is plastic. It's not tried, it's not tested, it is not proven.
where there is no wonder, no questions, no chaos, no confusion, there is no faith. We don't need faith if everything is okay. You don't need faith for tomorrow's breakfast if you have it in the freezer. But if you go and open that freezer and all you see is white, the walls of the fridge, then you know that God needs to come through by morning so that you can have something for the children. In fact, at that point, even the freezer becomes a product for sale. Because you can't eat the freezer, but you can eat the money that you can sell it. So you don't be proud inviting people to your house and showing them what things you have. That's immaterial. At that point, survival is what you need. Humility. Whether forced or not, it doesn't matter. Number two, how do we respond to these things? Have childlike faith. The tragedy of Christian maturity is we become too complicated and too mature for God. Even our prayer changes. Our language changes. Even our faith changes when we are praying. That girl who stood here, she just herself. That's the way she is, both here and at home. But what happens to believers? We become complicated. We even buy a New King James Version Bible so that we can learn the language of Jesus Christ. Jesus never spoke English for information. Thou, thou, God, hallelujah, hallelujah. You need to pray, just go sit down in your house. Just tell God, you know, to be honest with you, I'm really scared today. I'm not even sure you are there. But anyways, because I have faith, and your word tells me I need to have faith, I believe you are there. You know very well that we have no food. You know very well that the children need school fees. You know those people want me to bribe them to give that business. What do you expect me to do? That's how you should be talking to God like a child. How many of you would be happy Charles, your son Caleb comes and he wants this. Mr. Charles Kilonzo, <laughs> the husband to my mother, <laughs> the best dad in this world, the one who drives KCJ <laughs> and mentions even the car. I'm about to go back to school. What would you do, Charles? You would think your son needs to go to hospital, isn't it? <laughs> Can we be simple Christians? Be yourself. Be natural. <clears throat> Don't change your voice. In Mark chapter 10, verse 13 to 15, the Bible says, Then they brought little children to him, that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased. Not just displeased, greatly. Jesus was very offended by the act of the disciples. Because there is something that we don't like about children. We dismiss children. We relegate them. We don't listen to them. We assume them. And yet Jesus knew 
there is something about children that is very powerful. And he used that to teach a lesson. Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them. For such is the kingdom of God. Do you know the children did not really understand the intricacies of how Jesus was going to save the world. They were simply fascinated by him. They probably didn't know about the shedding of the blood or even because at this point he had not died or being, you know, they had not read the pro prophetic words that he would be, you know, hanged on the cross. They didn't know that. But just that curiosity, Jesus said, I want people that have this kind of a curiosity, like a child. And then he says, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he will by no means enter it. Friends, we are going to have to approach our faith like little children. Where a mother tells a child that we are going to get what you want, and the child believes and stops worrying about it. One time, Mumo came to me, he was very young, I can't remember how old he was. He asked me, Dad, can we go to the moon? I told him, yes, son, we will figure out how to go. <laughs> I didn't tell him, shut up, what's wrong with you? I told him, we will find a way. It's, it's people go there. We'll figure out how to go there. I'm, I'm not sure he's still waiting for us to go there. <laughs> but you see, the point is, he didn't tell me, ah, dad, what's wrong with you? You can't go to the moon. He didn't do that. He just believed me. And that's how we need to live with our father. When he says something, even if it looks like it won't happen, we just believe him. If he says, shall be well with you, you do what? You just believe him. How it's going to be well, that is his business, not yours. That will help you. Because if you start trying to explain and wonder, I assure you, you will not sleep. You see, the humility and the openness that enable children to believe in the unseen also sparks great wonder and curiosity. That's why kids are very curious. Many of us have lost curiosity. We have no idea the parts of that drum set. And you'll be amazed how ignorant you are about that drum set. But a child will come here and look at it and go there. And just look at it and admire it, understand things. We lose that curiosity. And no wonder we miss the goodness of God in so many things. Because we have lost the curiosity and the wonder of the simplicity of a child. We are too educated and too smart. Childlike faith is open to learning something new, to changing shape, to being wrong, and even asking hard questions. Children ask very hard questions. Some of us are embarrassed to ask questions, even when you know you don't know anything. You will struggle. Like my wife tells me, man, you have a problem. We are lost and I'm insisting, I think I know this place. He said, stop this guy and ask a question. I just keep driving, and we are lost for 10 minutes. 10 minutes because of the ego. Because I have been meant to believe if you ask questions, you are a fool. It's not true. In fact, if you don't ask questions, that's when you become a fool, because then you get lost for 10 minutes when you should have arrived 10 minutes earlier. Childlike faith is curious. It's eager to explore without demanding five pages of proof to verify what is being said. Today, when God tells you something, the next question you ask him is, Give me a sign. Give me what? God, if you are calling me, give me a sign. But a child, once you tell them something, they just believe it. And they don't ask you for proof. Prove it. That you are going. If you hear a child telling you, prove it, chances are you have lied to them once or twice. 
and that should really concern you. It's not like a child to say prove something, isn't it? No, they don't. If you tell them I'll do it, son or daughter, they just believe you and they go to play, they go to sleep, and they never forget. Tomorrow they will ask you, what is that thing you promised? Because they don't require five pages of submissions to believe you. When God says that he has taken care of our business, we will just believe him. Even when it doesn't appear like it's going to happen, we'll believe him. Number three, try to debrief. This is now the practical side of it. Debriefing is looking for someone who is preferably maturer than you and stable in the faith to talk to. Don't die with your questions. Debriefing does not necessarily mean that the person you're debriefing with is going to answer your questions. They are simply providing you an opportunity to talk and vent off. When somebody comes to you and tells you that God has lied to me, don't rebuke them. Even the psalmist did, did that. And he is in the Bible. You, you are not. You are not in the Bible. God trusted the psalmist enough, even after telling him you have forsaken me, he still put him where? In his word. Job, the same. So if someone comes to you and says, man, I'm so broken, I, I feel discouraged. I feel like God doesn't understand me. I feel like God has forsaken me. Try not to say many things. Just listen. Don't even say you understand. Because you can't. Listen to them. Let them speak. And then after they have spoken, just pray with them. And if you are honest, also tell them, there are moments I also have my own questions. But the word says God is faithful. Don't, don't throw away in too many scriptures. You know, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, that person probably knows more Bible than you, even when they have those questions. Just hold hands and pray a simple prayer. Say, Lord, thank you that this is your child. They have legitimate questions about the things that bother them. Lord, I pray that you reveal yourself to this your child. Let them know that despite all this, you still love and care for them. And then after that, go and bring a cup of tea and a huge loaf of bread. Just eat. That's how life is. We all struggle, but we need someone to talk to. The problem is when we don't have someone to talk to or we land in the wrong hands. Because it's at this point when people either lose their faith or become cultic. Because if you land in the hands of someone who begins to tell you, um, where do you come from? And then you tell them, that, okay, that particular area, there is a principality that tends to move in that area. And this is the spirit. You need to give an offering. That's how it goes, isn't it? Oh, I'm going to take you to someone. And before you know it, you're being taken to witches and witch doctors who are purporting to be prayer warriors and prophets and apostles. And before you know it, you have left church. The next time we meet, you look like you have been pulled along a, a stony path by a truck. You are beaten up and confused. So be careful who you go to. Because some of you will run into the wrong hands and they will take you to false prophets. Finally, keep asking those hard questions even if nobody has answers. You have a right to ask, like a child. God recognizes that childlike faith. And I believe God, in his time, he will answer you. And sometimes when God answers you, it is funny. Let's look at how God answered Job in the questions he was asking. Job 38 Verse 4, verse 12, and verse 19. I want us to read together. 
Okay? Verse 4, everybody read. Okay, stop there. You ask many questions, and God comes with his own questions. Where were you? In other words, the questions you are asking me now. Where do you think I was? Where was I standing myself when I laid the foundations of the earth where you are standing? <laughs> That's how God answered Job. Okay, the next, uh, verse 12. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? Now, let me quickly say this. I don't have time. This commanding the morning is a subject of an erroneous theological premise that has built an entire theology that they are calling commanding your morning. What God is telling Job is, are you the one who tells the sun to rise up and the morning to come? It's a rhetoric question. It's, simply, it's, like, it's like he's telling him, you cannot command the morning. That's what he's saying. But then some clever preachers have built a huge theology of commanding what? Your morning. As a movie, am I, am, I, am I doing proper theology? This man is a seasoned Bible teacher. When we were in Bible school with him, he did, he did uh, what were we calling it? Biblical? Master of Divinity. is a notch higher than what I studied. You spend more time in scriptures and the Bible. So he's simply telling him, you have not, in other words, he's telling him, I'm the one who commands the morning. I'm the one who determines how the day will come. So, <laughs> don't go into commanding mornings. <laughs> the morning is already commanded by your master. Just walk into his provision. His masses are new every morning. <laughs> Christianity is so simple. <laughs> it's complicated by some professionals. <laughs> The final question. <laughs> the final question. One to read. Uh -huh. Where is its place? So what I'm trying to tell you, when you ask God questions, also be prepared that he will also ask you questions. He'll ask you many questions. Let us pray. Thank you so much. I hope that you have listened to this message and it has edified you. Uh, if you have any questions, just share with us on the number that is being uh, projected on your screen and we will be more than happy to get back to you and answer those questions. Thank you so much. May God bless you. See you again next Wednesday, same time, same place. Amen.